Thank you all so much for joining this morning for the Regional Transportation Committee of Tuesday, December 14th, 2021. I'm Ashley Stolzman, Dr. Card Board Chair, and I'll be chairing the meeting this morning. I'm calling the meeting to order and we'll take attendance with the panelists so we don't need to call for the roll. Is there any public comment this morning? Please raise your hand using the raise hand feature at the bottom of your screen. Seeing none, that'll take us over to the meeting summary. Any comments on the meeting summary? If not, we'll accept it. Seeing none, that takes us to our only action item this morning, which is the FY 2022 to 2025 Transportation Improvement Program Amendments. Josh Schwenk, our, Schwenk sorry about that, Josh, our assistant planner is gonna take us through that. And if you're following in your packet, it's attachment B. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so there are just two uh, proposed Transportation Improvement Program amendments for you this morning. The first uh, will increase funding on the Central 70 project. That will add $15,059,000 in federal TIPIA loan funds. Uh, this is due to revised uh, debt estimates and to bring the TIP funding in line with the final uh, loan agreement for the uh, TIPIA. The second amendment is on the HOP Transit Service Expansion from the City of Boulder. This is a scope change to change uh, this project from service expansion to the purchase of battery electric buses. This is due to the impacts of COVID-19 on transit ridership and service levels that we've seen both here locally and around the country, um, making service expansion uh, impractical at this time. Uh, so uh, instead, the multimodal options funds will be repurposed to purchase uh, five to six battery electric buses. Uh, Additionally, there will be an addition of $323,000 in state faster transit funds and $1,745,000 in state settlement funds for this project. Um, I'd be happy to take any questions. Otherwise, I do have a proposed motion available on your screen. Any questions from members or discussion? If you use the raise hand feature, it's down at the bottom of the panel. There are no discussion points. If someone would like to raise their hand and make a motion. Director Shaw. Thank you. Um, I move to recommend to the board that the attached amendments or the attached amendments to the 2022 to 2025 tip. Thank you, Director Shaw. Director Flynn. I wanted to second that. I did see Deborah Johnson's hand up. I don't know if she had a comment or wanted to second it. Uh, I also but, saw that. Deborah, did you have something you wanted to add? I was just going to second it, but Director Flynn did it, so I'm fine. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Any discussion? I don't want to cut folks off if there were any questions or comments. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, please unmute yourself. All those in favor, say aye. 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 If I could just hear a few more people, that would make me feel better. Aye. Hi. Uh, I'll say hi. I'll buy it again. Hi. Thank you. Hi. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. The motion carries. I heard only like four people, so I felt a little uncomfortable. Thank you, everyone. The motion carries. <laughs> and that takes us to our next agenda topic, which is our first informational briefing. We have an advanced mobility partnership annual update. Emily Lindsay, our transportation technology strategist, is going to tell us about that. Hi, Emily. Hello. Good morning, everyone. All right. Everybody can see my screen just fine? Yes, we can. Wonderful. I'm Emily Lindsay. I'm the Transportation Technology Strategist at Dr. Cog, and I'm here to give you a quick update on the Advanced Mobility Partnership. Uh, this was a partnership that was established a couple years ago, really to coordinate and collaborate around transportation technology in the region. This is really in support of Mobility Choice Blueprint implementation, which was completed in early 2019. And so there's two different components of ANSA executive committee and the working group. And yeah, there's a couple different focus on focus areas that the AMP uh, partners are working on. And the AMP partners, again, are CDOT, Dr. Cog, RTD, and the Denver Metro Chamber. Um, but that working group really is made up of lots of different local stakeholders from local governments, other regional agencies, nonprofits, the private sector, all kinds of good stuff. Um, and so we've kind of initially been focused on three different buckets of, of tactical actions, shared mobility, system operations, and data and data sharing. And so uh, some of these are different, are part of different projects that the agencies are already working on. And then there's some additional work. Oh, I'm sorry. Did someone say something? Okay, keep going. <laughs> 
Um, and so I'm going to give you a quick update where we're at, the kind of work that we've done over 2021, and then um, I'd be happy to take questions. So I'm going to check in with you all mostly today about mobility data collection. This is something that is seen as a core across all of those tactical actions. Uh, we all know that transportation technology services programs and infrastructure have uh, a lot, they collect a lot of data, they can generate a lot of information, and we need to be able to understand how our programs, our projects, our services um, can kind of relate to our shared goals and outcomes in the region, whether it's on things like safety, equity, sustainability, or accessibility. Um, and we also need to understand how this data collection um, and analysis can help us work collaboratively collaboratively across the space, whether this is addressing kind of shared challenges around data access and availability, different privacy components, depending on the data collection. Uh, actually, the analysis, take, having structures to take in some of these larger big data sets, and then how that all affects decision making. So that's kind of the context in which we're working on mobility data collaboratively. And so earlier this year, we worked with stakeholders to put out a series of a couple different reports, a discovery report, which really looked at kind of the state of the practice um, in the region. We looked at what other folks are doing in regions across the United States and put out a case study report. And then we worked with stakeholders uh, and conducted a survey just to learn about kind of the baseline, what folks are thinking um, they need, they'd like in the future, looking forward uh, towards our other planning and data and data sharing in the transportation space. And so this fall, we held a three to three series workshop with Harvard's Kennedy School. This was really intended to bring in kind of an outside perspective to help us build on stakeholder work that we had done previously and really understand the challenges. So why are we even considering doing something this, like this, right? Understanding the, the different uh, challenge areas, the different use cases that folks have to address different, uh, like those different challenges that I just mentioned. Um, and then really to kind of help us better contextualize the work that we need to do in the space, um, which we kind of built out around three different problem areas. And I just put a couple different use cases in here um, so that we could get an idea, but there are a ton more. Uh, we tried to contextualize these through three main challenge areas, understanding how people move throughout the region. This might relate to trip behavior, mode choice, understanding volumes, travel times, delays, that kind of good stuff. Um, ensuring safe mobility and situational awareness was a challenge area that really had that kind of real-time operations component, understanding crash data, safety implications in real time, and then preparation for new modes, which the use cases I think are developing as modes kind of come out and are deployed in the region, but having the partnerships, the standards and systems that are just kind of ready to go. This is something that we've tested out with shared micromobility in the region with success, and just knowing that we have to be prepared for things like that in the future. Oops. And then I just wanted to highlight a couple of other things that are unrelated to the data and data sharing art in which we've really been focused on this year. Um, but I wanted to bring folks attention to the working group, which meets every single month. Um, this is a great forum for coordination, different briefings, discussions around transportation technology elements and projects in the regions. This is just to give you a little taste of some of the topics that we talk about every month. Um, so no meeting is the same. <laughs> we really will focus on kind of projects and policies that are related to efforts underway in the region, whether that is around electrification, emissions, dashboards, uh, different grant opportunities so that we can collaborate, different projects uh, that are happening at our research institutions in the region um, around specific projects that our partner agencies are working on, whether that's transit priority at RTD or OpenGIS at CDOT. Um, we really wanted to kind of have a chance to highlight all this information with our regional partners and have a place to chat if we have issues that kind of arise so that we can really address things in a coordinated manner. So like I said, this group meets every month. It's open to anyone that wants to join. Um, so if your staff or you have somebody in mind that um, might like to tune in, certainly let me know. So that is a quick overview of our 2021 efforts um, as related to the Advanced Mobility Partnership. If anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to chat. Otherwise, my email address is on the screen and you can always reach out. Thank you, Emily. Wonderful. Any questions or discussion on this? First, we have Director Cook. Oh, thank you. Uh, quickly, uh, to the extent you have the operations um, priorities, for example, for uh, transit priority on major thoroughfares or, or corridors, does that later get reflected somehow in the waiting in the TIP process? I, I was wondering uh, if a community is interested in um, building 
transit priority into a thoroughfare uh, that goes along uh, an RTD route, does that then get weighted appropriately in a way that would make it more likely to get funded? Roger, I'm, I'm glad that we have Todd on the line also, so he can answer any tip specific questions. Um, I think the idea is that we want to get all of this planning context right out there in front of folks and partners so that they can be integrated into different decision making processes as they come about. Um, something that we saw in the MVRTP was that list of bus rapid transit core priority corridors that we know Dr. Cog is kind of building into our UPWP to do more work on. And then on the tip side, again, once we're able to kind of frame our different shared priorities, we have a little bit more leverage as we're building out specific criteria, but I will open the line to Todd in case he has anything specific on the tip he would like to bring up. Todd or Ron, did you want to add anything? Uh, yeah, this is Todd. Thank you, Emily. Um, so I think the one thing I would point out is, uh, uh, again, what, I, what Emily said is absolutely correct. Um, and if a project like that was to come forward um, within the application that are proposed, um, that would be included and weighted within a section um, that is basically worth 50% of the overall application. So um, while that specific project type would not be weighted um, any different than maybe another similar uh, high priority project um, that is related to the RTP, um, those types of projects certainly would be contained within a section that is weighted at 50% of the overall score. Director Cook, do you feel like that answered your question? Yeah. Did you have anything? No, thank you, Todd and Emily. I appreciate that. Thank you, Director Cook. Any other questions or comments from folks? All right, if you think of something just before you're falling asleep tonight, it was elindsay at drcog.org. Um, so you can give her a shout out. Thank you very much. And we'll go to our next informational update, uh, which is continued discussion of the draft tip policy and call for projects. Todd Cottrell, our senior planner, will tell us about that. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good morning, everyone. Um, so the focus of this morning's presentation is to bring you through a draft version of the tip policy and the two applications that will go along with that. Um, sort of as a preview of what's coming up, uh, we will be bringing this information back to you next month. Um, for action and hopes that we're able to release the first of four calls for projects um, starting in late January. So that's sort of what's coming up. Um, both this policy and these applications are included as attachments um, for your viewing this after uh, this morning. Um, so first wanted to just give you a very high level overview of some of the changes that have taken place um, versus the existing TIP policy document to the proposed version. Um, so overall, the version that you see within your attachment um, is in track changes. Um, basically, it's gonna exclude any, any sort of wordsmithing or funding year changes or basic, you know, basic level changes um, that we would make um, going from one version of a document to the next. Um, one thing to highlight is that we have reoriented this document to remove the actual TIP years. Um, essentially, from a staff perspective, what we are trying to transform this document into um, is a document that we can use for all future calls. Uh, essentially, there will be no need to readopt this uh, policy document every four years. Every four years, we would simply just amend it um, as necessary. Um, so, certainly, this will be easier on a staff perspective, but we certainly will still seek both technical and policy input before calls for projects to make those adjustments that are necessary before we release calls for projects. Um, so the next three or four slides kind of outline changes, a high level changes by chapters. So uh, just simply looking at chapter one, um, we've updated the tip schedule and uh, just made it more generalized. Uh, so it fits in with that overall document um, theme. Within chapter two, so this outlines the roles and requirements. Um, for agency roles, uh, we have certainly adjusted the funding sources and cleaned them up um, so that they meet the new requirements of the federal transportation bill. Uh, for capital uh, project eligibility, or sometimes referred to as these, cap these capacity projects um, that are taken um, out of the regional transportation plan. So if a sponsor is interested in funding one of those types of projects, uh, and if that project is in that 2020 to 2029 staging period um, for the TIP, 
these projects would be eligible for any phase, meaning if they wanted to submit for, say, pre-construction activities or construction, uh, it certainly would be eligible. Um, however, if that project is listed in that 2030 to 2039 stage, it would be only eligible for those project development or pre-construction activities, uh, excluding the actual construction of projects. For projects that have a technology component, um, we have certainly cleaned up and expanded that language um, to, to relate back to the regional operations plan and the systems engineering analysis. Um, concerning freight, uh, we have uh, beefed up and added language related to the economy, reliability, and emissions. Uh, moving on to chapter three, which outlines the initial program activities that Dr. Cog takes before calls for projects are issued. Um, so again, we've cleaned up some of that language regarding the funding sources. We have updated the set aside programs based on previous discussions that committees have had. Uh, we've also removed two other commitments that were listed in previous policies. Uh, this includes the commitment that Dr. Cog made for Central 70 and the fast track uh, system. Uh, so chapter four outlines the actual calls for projects, both regional and sub-regional. Um, so overall, we've replaced the focus areas with the 2050 MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan project and program investment priorities. Again, as we had previously discussed on, um, earlier this summer, um, within the fi financial requirements for all projects um, that intend to submit, we've clarified that multimodal options fund match language. So moving into the regional share and then the sub-regional share, for the regional share, we've updated what the intent of those projects are, and that's essentially to link to the regional MetroVision objectives and outcomes. For funding of projects in the regional share, um, there will now be a 20% minimum match requirement versus 50 in the previous cycle. We've also updated the project and program eligibility requirements. Um, we've also noted that there will be a parallel track application. So we'll explain a little bit more in detail um, here in a few slides, uh, essentially what that means. Within the sub-regional share, um, we've updated the funding targets um, based on current data. Um, so the funding targets or the sub-regional sub share uh, is further broken down into uh, individual sub-regions with a funding target. So again, we've updated that with current data. Um, very similar to the regional share, we've updated the eligibility requirements. Um, I, I think from a perspective of ones who actually are submitting projects, um, this will look quite different, um, but it still contains very similar open eligibility. Um, concerning forums, um, we've updated language that says that if you are taking a vote or taking an action during a meeting, that must actually take place during a meeting, whether in person or virtual. Um, you are not allowed to make a vote um, via email, polling, some other electronic means outside of a meeting that is being held. Um, and again, just a couple of additional things. We've noted that parallel track, which we'll explain here in a second, and then uh, sort of change the application submittal process. Basically, app applications will be sent to Dr. Cog first. Um, that will give us a chance to um, check for eligibility, post them to our website, um, adjust the scoring sheets, and then turn those over to uh, more of the technical folks who will work on the scoring process um, within each subregion. Um, chapter five concerning TIP development, so the development of the actual TIP document. Uh, we've refined and clarified what amendments and administrative modifications are and what triggers those. Um, we've essentially said if there is a funding increase, um, we would seek Dr. Cog board approval to issue a new call for projects um, in addition to what is actually on the waitlist process. Um, Appendix A, which contains the selection processes for RTD and CDOT, um, we've updated that RTD process to refer it to the midterm financial plan. And again, the CDOT process refers to the 10-year plan. And then again, other minor changes within uh, both of those. All right, so now we can finally move on to the TIP applications themselves. And as promised, uh, a little bit more detail on what these two applications mean. Um, so the main purpose here is really to be able to leverage uh, similar funding types, 
types together. So the multimodal options fund program has been retained um, and that will be retained at a 50% match. While these other federal funding sources contain a 20% match. So we were looking for ways to um, sort of combine these funds together to lower that 50% match requirement. So it made it a little bit more equal in terms of when a project sponsor was submitting projects. Um, so the recommendation is to use essentially two applications or two different tracks. So STBG, which stands for Surface Transportation Block Grant, one of our primary funding, funding programs, um, there will have one dedicated application that will use these funds for all the eligible projects under that program. Um, this will continue and retain that 20% match requirement. For the next application is the air quality and multimodal application. Um, this will use a combination of these sources, again, the, the state multimodal options fund, and then the three other federal funding sources. We'll use all four of these funding sources together uh, to fund projects that essentially meet that air quality and multimodal definition. Uh, overall, they will be required, or sponsors will be required to commit to a 20% local match for those federal funds. Uh, but essentially how we're able to, to combine this is to be able to use those federal funding sources plus that local match. Uh, we'll use those two funding sources to match the multimodal options fund. Um, so again, combining all the sources of funds to make it a lot easier for, for project sponsors to be able to submit those types of projects, but using a lower match rate, one very comparable to uh, the other funding sources. Um, the primary key difference in the terms of the actual applications, um, that air quality and multimodal application uh, will exclude um, roadway capacity projects, roadway reconstruction, or bridge projects, essentially those types of projects that do not improve congestion or improve air quality. So the, the basic application structure is broken down into four sections, um, the first being the regional impact of the proposed project. Um, section B, um, the Regional Transportation Plan Priorities. Again, this was the for, formerly the, the TIP focus areas. Um, so this will look at safety, active transportation, air quality, multimodal mobility, freight, uh, and regional transit, and essentially look at types of questions that would um, you know, seek to answer some of the questions that are important within those specific categories. Um, section, section C, uh, carryover from previous applications called project leveraging. Um, section D is a new section that Dr. Cogstaff is proposing pr called project readiness. So regional impact of a proposed project uh, with a proposed section weight of 30%. Again, this is very similar to the previous um, application and section that was just called regional significance. Um, but it's asking questions such as, you know, what is the importance of my project? How does my project solve this regional or if it's a sub-regional application, sub-regional problem? Uh, what is the impact of my project on the disproportionate impact in environmental justice populations? Or how does my project make progress towards Metro Vision outcomes, um, really focusing in on access and the connectivity of these uh, transportation systems? Um, a majority of the applicants in this section will respond with a narrative answer. Um, on some of those questions, they'll be required to provide a, a quantitative uh, response along with that narrative. Um, so the application itself includes some checkboxes and data tables to help the sponsor um, provide that additional um, quantitative data that will be included within their narrative. Um, section B, again, is the MetroVision Regional Transportation Priorities. Uh, with a proposed section weight of 50%. Um, and essentially is, you know, how does my project address each of these six priority investments areas um, that, we, that we went through here uh, on the last couple of slides. Um, all of the answers um, required by sponsors are gonna be a narrative with a quantitative, re quantitative information. And again, the application contains um, some check boxes and data tables to really help the sponsor provide that information that can be included in, in, within their narrative answer. Uh, section C is, is again, uh, project leverage with a proposed section weight of 10%. Uh, essentially what's going on here is the, you know, these projects will be scored um, basically how much um, 
match are you providing in excess of the minimum requirement? Um, so if you're going to provide additional overmatch, uh, your score will be based on that, depending on which application you're filling out. Uh, and finally, the new section project readiness with a proposed weight of 10% overall. Um, the types of questions in here are um, really questions that project sponsors should be doing anyhow. Uh, the application is looking and screening projects based on those, those very common pitfalls that happen or that could happen within any project. Um, these are things, again, like I said, that should always be reviewed outside of the application before you're submitting um, for this call. Um, so we're essentially looking for, have you identified and or, and or mitigated some of these potential roadblocks? Um, we're looking at what is your status of the right of way? Um, what is your availability of the matching funds? Um, have you, or what have you done in terms of public engagement to date? Um, and again, we're looking through the application. These can be answered both through check boxes and the narrative um, descriptions to gather really um, what essentially have you done to date on your project. Um, in terms of the scoring methodology, uh, each question is scored on a scale of zero to five. Uh, it's also scored in, rel in relationship to the other projects that are being received. Um, so again, there's these check boxes and these data tables contained within the application will help guide that narrative answer. And if you do want to be considered for full points, um, you will want to incorporate that data into your narrative response. Um, just some other things, key things to remember. Um, so Dr. Cogstaff is developing a data application that will help um, the sponsors who are filling out these applications with that project data. Um, you will also be required to include within the application sort of key project milestones. So when do you anticipate to uh, execute your IGA or when do you anticipate uh, to be able to advertise? Um, these are things that from a project sponsor filling out, out an application really should already have this information on hand because they will need this information to really assess what kind of costs are going to be associated with that. So we're just asking for that information to be included. Um, as part of their application packet, they'll be required to submit a cost estimate. Um, to improve your score within the project readiness section, um, we are asking that if you would like to improve that score, uh, please have a licensed engineer essentially review the information within the application and provide their name. Um, basically saying, you know, we've re reviewed these impacts and we've uh, completed these mitigation efforts on these elements of your project. Uh, and finally, you know, something that we certainly would explain within our tip training, but the more time that applicants spend now going through all this information, the, the better their project will be in the long run. Um, potential to avoid cost overruns in the future, avoid project delays in the future, um, really avoid any scheduling things they have um, that, that may interact with each other in the future. So again, it's worth the time to spend um, that time and effort now, um, and it certainly will help you into the future. Uh, so that concludes the information that I have for you today. Um, and like I said, we will bring this information back to you next month for action. Um, in hopes that we're able to release a call for projects coming up here in late January. So be happy to take any comments or questions that you may have on any of these documents. Thank you very much, Todd. That was the most impressive use of the term roadblock I've ever heard in a presentation. <laughs> Our first question is from Jessica. Thank you. Thank you, Todd, for this overview. It's really helpful. I'm curious, um, in looking under uh, Dr. Cog calls for projects, I'm curious to know why the, the whole section about disproportionately impacted or vulnerable communities was completely removed. I mean, I can see it in the evaluation process that it that is definitely a focus, but it just is, isn't specifically called out. I, Josh, is it possible to pull up the application? Uh, one second. Okay. And, and I apologize, I don't remember and while, exactly what was done off the top of my head. No well, worries, it's on page well, three. While they're pulling that up, Ron, Papstorf has to something to add in. Uh, thank you, and Commissioner Hogan, Hogan, I wanted to point you to the 
to the actual application where that is contained in um, section A question four specifically. So it is a very important consideration and I'll, I'll take the opportunity to also note that one of the changes in the process that we will be utilizing um, this tip cycle is how we approach public engagement and public comment. So in previous tip cycles, usually there's sort of a recommendation from our committees and board on a set of initial allocations or awards to projects. And then we issue that whole set of recommendations out and request um, public, public comment or public information. We're actually going to build that into this process now in the evaluation process. So once we have all the applications in, we'll release all the applications out to the public, seek public comment and input um, as part of the actual evaluation and review um, and award and award decisions um, in that process. So I wanted to wanted to point to that change as well as another effort on our part to to seek more meaningful and timely uh, public and in, uh, public input. Thank you. Yeah, I did see it there in the in as part of the whole evaluation. I was just wondering why that text was removed from the from the actual policy. So. And I don't know if I have an answer for that. I will certainly go back within the policy and take a look um, to make sure that we're we're capturing everything that's necessary. Thank you. Thank you for the feedback. Any other comments or questions? Oops. Trying to get my participant screen up. Director X, Executive Director X. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Dr. Hook's staff, as well as TAC staff. I mean, they spent a tremendous amount of time in the development of this, as they always do every four years um, in, pre in preparation of this. Todd, I had a question with regards to the cost estimate. Is one of the last slides that was there. We, we still anticipate that they are required to submit the year of expenditure dollars, right? That is correct. So okay, when they are... Sure. Yeah. When an app... When an applicant goes through their application, they should be doing that already. But yes, we have specified within the policy and the application that we expect it to be in year of expenditure dollars. Thank you, sir. And um, Director Dean, Dale had to take off to another meeting. I think he's going to try to join by phone. <clears throat> Any other comments or questions from folks? I have just one, um, and so I really appreciate what I think staff was trying to do with the multimodal options fund match. Uh, communities always have a really hard time making their match, um, and so trying to level the playing field there and and um, do what staff has done was really, I think, productive, and the communities will be grateful. I do think it's worthy of a conversation because when the multimodal options funding was being discussed at the legislature, there was a lot of talk around that 50% being a really positive thing because it would bring more outside money to the table. And, um, you know, I sort of brought up this issue about communities actually have a really hard time coming up with 50% match. That's going to be a really big challenge. And that argument lost the day in the, in the conversation. So I just wonder if we're being true to the intent um, by doing that. I do think it'll help get projects across the line. And I do, I mean, I recognize it brings other types of funding to the table for multimodal projects. So maybe that still meets the spirit of it, but I think it's worthy of a conversation with this group. Uh, Director Papstorf. Yeah, uh, Chair Stoltzman, Ron Pepsgrove here again, and I, I I think you answered the question the way I would have answered it. We believe that we believe this approach actually does meet the intent of the statutory language for the multimodal options fund program that requires a 50% non-multimodal options fund match. It doesn't say a local match. It doesn't say a non-state match or a non-federal match. It's it's other funds besides multimodal options fund. And so it, we believe that it does meet that intent of, of bringing additional resources to basically double the state's commitment to the multimodal options fund program. And our conversations with with uh, folks in the administrative side um, at the at the state level, uh, believe this is co as a, a consistent approach uh, with that statutory re requirement as well. Thank you very much um, for that, Director Papstorf. I just wonder, and, and I, I think you've done a really good job. I was not trying to be critical of what staff has put together there uh, in this, but I just think it's worthy of a, a discussion. Director Williams. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I, I'm just wondering if we could have some examples of what kind of funding would be non-multimodal options fund match? Like, 
who, who's not invested in multimodal options that would give a 20% match funding? Yeah. Director so Sorry, Todd, I was calling on you. Sorry, oh, sorry, sorry to interrupt. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. Uh, so essentially what is meant by non-multimodal funds match could mean local sources of funding, uh, could mean any federal transportation sources of funding. So um, in addition to the multimodal options fund, Dr. Cog allocates four additional sources of, of federal funds. So th those could all be essentially combined um, to help match to use as mass for that 50% um, match requirement. But those are not multimodal related. Correct. I, I think the reference essentially is, as long as they're not multimodal options fund, they can be used for match. The funding sorts itself doesn't have to be exclusively available um, for multimodal type projects. Okay, I I just have a little issue because in, in my world, everything is related to multimodal and, and it seems like everything that you guys do is related to multimodal. So it's probably just me with the big broad transit brain. Um, thanks, Todd. Director Papstorf? Um, yeah, uh, Director Williams, I'll, maybe I'll, I think Todd, Todd got to it. I'll, maybe I'll try a little bit different tack. When we say non-multimodal options fund resources, we mean anything other than the very specific state funding program, which is the multimodal options fund program. So you're right. Many, many funding sources have a multimodal component, have multimodal eligibilities. Um, what we're saying is any, any, any fund that's not included within that state multimodal options fund program specifically. Got it. That, that, now I got it. Thanks. Wonderful. Any other discussion on this topic? All right. Well, thank you for all the hard staff work that went into this. I think all that upfront work will make it go much more smoothly on the back end. So thank you for that. And if you think of questions later, you guys, um, please email Todd and Ron and we'll get those taken care of. And so that takes us to our next informational briefing, which is the annual listing of federally obligated projects. Um, Todd will also take us through that today. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so each year, um, MPOs such as Dr. Cog are required to produce a report um, essentially called the ALOP report. ALOP standing for the Annual Listing of Federally Obligated Projects. Uh, obligation in this term means essentially the federal government's promise to pay uh, for that element or your entire project. Um, so again, each year, Dr. Cog produces this. Um, this report is for federal fiscal year 21, um, which goes back from October 1st of 2020 and just concluded this last uh, September. Um, in conclusion, there was 81 transportation projects um, totaling $217.4 million. Um, so on attachment E in the back, there is the actual report um, towards the back of the report, it does outline the individual projects and the individual obligation they, they, uh, they received. Now, I certainly would point out that this project is, re um, is developed and reported essentially with a snapshot in time. Um, it will not give you any idea of sort of what the actual project status is. Um, so again, it's, its purpose is really to say, this is the obligation for this project um, it does not indicate that this project has continued to construct or to finish design or any other element besides providing the actual dollar amount that was obligated within this um, within two certain dates. So um, with that, be happy to take any comments or questions that you have on this report. Any comments or questions from members? Seeing none, we'll accept the report. Thank you. And that's um, last we have some administrative items. The meeting schedule, I believe, is in the packet um, for next year. Our next meeting is January 18th, 2021. Any other member comments or matters by members this morning? All right, seeing none, thank you so much. Oh, I, I have a closing you. remark, Ashley. Director Williams, perfect time for that. Okay. Um, do you guys know how a sheep says Merry Christmas? I do not. 
Feliz Navidad, everyone. <laughs> Thank you, Director Williams. That's a perfect way to sign off. And we'll see you all next time. We're adjourned. Hi, everybody. Be safe. Have a great day. Bye. Bye. Bye.